in the sub-Antarctic islands. Um, this talk is not entirely accurate because um, it also includes a, an Australian sub-Antarctic island. Um, th this, this area here that I'm circling, you can see my marker there, can you? That, that shows up on the screen. Um, that's Macquarie Island, which is an Australian island, and also it um, includes the Chatham Islands, which aren't exactly sub-Antarctic, but that, that was the, uh, the, the route that we took. Um, it sounds terribly um, polar sub-Antarctic, but in fact the latitudes aren't really that, that far south at all. Um, the furthest, the, the, the most southerly is, is about 55 degrees south at Macquarie and, and up on, um, on, on the Bounty Islands it's, it's about uh, 44. So in fact, you know, we're, we're um, London is at what, 53 north and, and we're closer to the North Pole here than any of these islands are to the South Pole. It's mm -hmm. just that they've got a very, um, a very um, polar sort of climate. Yeah, yeah. Mm. <laughs> um, here they are again and you can see I, I said that they're remote because they genuinely are um, they are miles and miles away 5,000 miles from any other islands on the same latitude um, this is the the Antarctic Peninsula is, is the place where most people go and you know there's nothing along here or along there to be, be that you to meet any other land at all. Um, so they are remote in that respect. Um, and also there's only a couple of hundred people a year manage to get down there compared to the sort of tens, 20, 30,000 people that visit Antarctica to, to South Georgia, the Falklands and, and the South Shetland Islands. Um, but climatically they are really um, very different to, to us. They're prone to very long periods of strong winds, rain, cold and cloud, far worse than any, anything up here. Um, Macquarie averages 314 days a year of precipitation, mists and drizzle and, and some snow. They're extremely windy. Um, it, it, it's, all, it, it's in this formidable sounding roaring 50s and furious 50s, the latitudes. And the reason that they're so windy, of course, is if you think of Antarctica, it's a continent surrounded by, a, by an ocean, and the North Pole, the Arctic, is, is an ocean surrounded by land masses. So there's nothing to stop these winds cir that circulate around the, around the globe, racing right the way round and round and round with nothing to stop them, hence you get these um, pretty ferocious, um, ferocious seas. Um, That's it, here we go. This, this is a, um, a, a geology map. I'm not gonna to say too much of the geology because we've got an eminent geologist watching us, but um, this, is, this shows you, th these, are, these are some of the islands that we're talking about, these little red pimples south of the South Island of, of, of New Zealand. Um, and they're all part of, a, of the same sort of submarine plateau. I think it's part of what was a, a sort of mini continent of, of Zealandia, part of bits of Gondwana land that split off many, many, um, thousands, millions of years ago. Um, some are granitic, I believe, metamorphic parts of the seabed rock, other parts ancient Gondwana land, and some of them are quite recent. I think Macquarie Island um, is only about 700,000 years old and, and I believe is unique in that it's apparently the only island on the planet formed by the collision of two oceanic plates pushing the actual Earth's crust up into above, above water level, but um, I'm sure David Webster could um, verify that for me. So they're among the world's wildest and remotest places, even with the vastness of the forbidding Antarctic Ocean, they're remote from any other island group. Um, and depending on their geology, they're a sort of mix of um, rugged and natural habitats, some still near pristine, others badly affected by attempted colonization, introduced flora and fauna and over-exploitation. Um, so this is, this is uh, what a lot of them look like. Um, 
some of them some of the bigger islands have a little bit more going for them this this is uh Auckland, the Auckland Islands group, they're, they're, they're bigger, they've got a few plants and, and uh, they're not just absolutely bare rock, but they're, 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 they're pretty uh, way up there in, in terms of their bleakness. Um, so this is a little bit about the history of how they were first discovered. The first island to be discovered here, well, let's first say that um, there are a few scant relics indicating that some groups of Maori discovered them um, 600 years ago, but it seems that the remoteness and climate didn't allow them to thrive and none survived. Um, so these islands were basically rediscovered by um, European sailors. Um, Bounty Island was the first one in 1788. Um, Captain Cook on his way from South America taking breadfruit to plant in Tahiti and got blown off course and, and of course they're named after the ill-fated ship that he was uh, captain of at the time. Um, then the next one, um, three years later, the Snares Islands, called the Snares because um, of, of the potential for sort of shipwrecks and, and, uh, and how dangerous they were. And then the Antipodes, a bit later on, 1800, um, called the Antipodes because at this point, if you, if you put a line between there right through the centre of the planet, um, you'd come out in London. So, you know, British sailors were calling it the Antipodes Islands, the absolute opposite end of the planet. Um, then Auckland Islands in 1806, Macquarie 1810, Campbell Island. And then, of course, the, the Chatham Islands up here are, are much more mellow. Um, better climate, and those were first colonised by um, the Moriori, a, a group of Maoris back in the 1500s. Um, yeah, so these were all, all discovered more or less by accident, um, wandering whaling vessels. Um, the Auckland Islands were called the Aucklands after Lord Auckland, um, Macquarie after the Governor General of New South Wales. Um, Chatham Islands after the ship that they were on, the HMS Chatham. So they've only been known to us for you know, really just a, you know, two or three hundred years. And this gives you a, a quick idea of the size of them. Um, to, some of them are absolutely tiny. Auckland Island here, 62,000 hectares, which is almost the same size, I believe, as Isla. Um, some of the others, the Bounty Islands, are, are barely even a decent sized farm, 135 hectares. So some of them are tiny little specks of rock and others substantially larger. And the Chathams, you know, quite a bit bigger still. So soon after discovery, whalers, sealers set up camps, some seasonal, some attempting to be permanent. They rapidly began decimating the huge populations of elephant seals. Um, fur seals and sea lions for their oil and fur. Millions of animals were killed over a hundred years or more of slaughter. Um, that's pretty awful, but the conditions for the men working there were absolutely foul as well. Um, they were often marooned or shipwrecked. I think the longest lot were shipwrecked for about eight years. Um, so pretty, pretty tough stuff. Um, at the same time, the islands were used as a land base for whaling, and when seals were running low, penguins for oil and feathers were slaughtered in equally huge numbers. Um, with all these riches available, it was important to claim sovereignty um, by establishing permanent settlements, and, uh, and Britain, via their colonies in Australia and New Zealand, got there, got there first. Um, these pictures illustrate that the top left one here, it, these are the remains of these sort of boiling pots that they used to march unsuspecting penguins into a great vat and boil them down for their oil. Um, here's some of the men taking a break surrounded by their um, naive penguins that they're about to, to, to chop up. Um, the bottom left here, they, they set up a whole load of these little um, huts just in case people got shipwrecked there. They, they would have them provisioned and, and so that people could, could uh, have some shelter should they get stuck there. And this bottom right picture is the remains of a frame of a boat that some people that were shipwrecked made to try and escape the island. I've absolutely no idea whether they made it, but it looks pretty flimsy to be going around in those sorts of seas. So um, there were people settling there. Um, 
especially on the more hospitable island groups of Campbell and Auckland. Campaigns inviting colonists to go and farm on these newly found islands promised far better conditions than the harsh reality. Um, even the tiny little islands that are just bare rocks, Bounty Islands and the Antipodes, for instance, were mentioned in Britain as, you know, new places to colonise. They obviously had no idea, but were just desperate to get people out there to say that they were, they were British. Um, but they did try on some of the, some of the better islands. Um, and this is um, Enderby. Enderby had a, a whaling and sealing company and he set up a, um, a colony um, which failed very rapidly. Um, so although the colony attempts failed, they of course left behind all their surviving alien species that they'd taken to the islands. You can see here cows, goats, rats, pigs, cats, sheep, rabbits, the lot. They were all, uh, they were all left there. Some of them they were leaving thousands and thousands of livestock behind when they realised that these islands just couldn't uh, really sensibly support people farming in, in any way whatsoever. They were just too remote. And so we get this horrible business that we get in New Zealand, all over New Zealand, but here as well, of, um, of these wonderful animals, birds in particular, there were no land mammals there, um, becoming extinct very rapidly as soon as, as soon as man got there and started putting his, uh, his pests on there. They were destroying the habitat, the vegetation and predating. You'll notice there's a, a very sort of strong um, uh, bias towards rails, which are notoriously um, easy prey and they, they tend not to fly. And there's some more. Um, there were, I think 14 species were lost from these islands, totally, totally extirpated, lost forever. And, and that's in addition to about 40 more on mainland New Zealand, of course. Um, so they were lost due to human hunting, habitat loss and predation by introduced animals, introduced mammals. But um, by the mid 1900s, with these islands once again uninhabited and an awareness of their ecological importance, thoughts turned to their restoration and protection. Um, these extracts from conservationist notebooks on Macquarie Island really say it all. Um, they're, um, it's interesting, they're talking about weckers. They, they, a lot of these native rails became extinct and then they go and introduce a, a, a rail from New Zealand there, which, which becomes quite predatory. They start digging up petrels and and eating their eggs. And it says here, the number of rodents at this hut has increased dramatically. Um, talking about huge numbers of cats. It's, and then later on, 30 years later, when they're actually starting this program back in 2010, it says here, you know, landslips not uncommon steep slopes, enormous numbers of rabbits have added to the in instability, um, whole hillside moving, it was rabbits in their hundreds. Um, and then from the same person, obviously, um, saying that uh, they're going to, to, to get, get cracking here um, and, and what they're going to use, baiting program, um, specially trained dogs that will only take the, uh, the, the, the uh, targeted um, introduced animals. And, and this is just a quick reminder of the sorts of things that they were they were doing. Um, huge, I mean, it's, it's massively expensive, labour intensive, long term, um, but they're very, very successful at it. This is a um, picture of a helicopter dropping um, poison bait, or you can put the poison bait down here on the left in, into little um, traps. And then once you've hopefully got rid of most of the of the um, animals you didn't want, you can get specially trained dogs to, to sniff the rest of them out and catch them or, or, or go and shoot them. But it, it is a very, very um, labour intensive job. And so nowadays they're all World Heritage sites, very carefully protected. New Zealanders and Australians are masters of eradication of pests from islands and continue to read many islands all around the world. Um, some of you will know from uh, living on, on Isla that um, if you've ever been over to Orense, the RSPB reserve, they did a similar sort of thing on a much smaller scale a few years ago, got rid of rats on some little offshore islets and instantly you start getting um, breeding success from 
turns and gulls and things like that. So that's a little bit of the history. And now we're getting on to, on to, to my actual visit um, there. Um, so it's, it's my, my visit's a bit more positive than the grizzly history because you know they're now being very, very well looked after. So that's the route that we took. Um, started in Invercargill and went in a, in a sort of anti-clockwise trip right the way around and back to, back to Dunedin. The main reason for going, other than being persuaded by Mike Peacock um, to, 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 to go there, um, was that they are very remote and I do love islands. Um, say only a couple of hundred visitors a year, so it's a pretty privileged place to get to. Um, lots of endemic birds, so that if you're a keen birder, there are species there that you're not gonna see anywhere else in the world. And it really is, you know, the seabird mecca, the seabird capital of, of, um, of the world, really. Um, about 80 species of seabirds alone in, in New Zealand, and many of them found in abundance down here. So that's the ship that we were on. Um, it's definitely no frills. It's, a, it's, a, it's an ex-Russian um, ship, still with Russian crew. Um, and despite several long sea voyages that I've done before in Antarctica and various other places, I was quite worried about seasickness as it's a very small ship. And as I say, it has these, this reputation, you know, the roaring 40s and, and uh, furious 50s. Um, and in fact, I met the rep, this is Heritage Expeditions, and I met their rep at the British Bird Fair before I went. And uh, he said that, it, I got his words almost verbatim. He said, there will almost certainly be a few days when you will feel awful and you'll not be allowed onto the deck as it's too rough and dangerous. Um, not the best sales pitch for a very expensive holiday, but we went anyway. And in fact, we're really quite lucky and we didn't have horrendously rough seas. It wasn't too bad at all. But these little orange lifeboats that you can see here, you, know, you go through all the usual stuff at the beginning. You sit in these and you're told what will happen if, if everything goes wrong, which you hope it doesn't. And, uh, and then you set off south and you get to Snares. Um, these, this is the only island group that we visited that has absolutely never had um, any introduced animals on, so they don't allow anyone on it at all. It's completely pristine. Um, so all you can do is to sail around it, um, zodiac round it, um, and look for some of the special birds. Now this is a, a bit of video. I've got a few video clips here. This is just a... So, I mean, that's a little bit worse than Calmac on a bad day, I suppose, but um, that, that's about as bad as it got. Um, so we start seeing some of the special birds there. The snares penguin is, is, is only on the snares islands, 60,000 birds there and completely unique to these, these islands that no one's allowed on. Um, so that was a good start. Um, and as I said there, this is just a map of all the radio satellite tagging tracking that they've done on sooty shearwaters. There's five million pairs of sooty shearwaters nesting on these islands. And this is, here we are down here below New Zealand, and this is the whole of the Pacific that they're ranging around um, when they're away from the island. And uh, so you start seeing seabirds big time. Um, I hasten to add that virtually none of these, in fact, almost entirely, yeah, none of these are my pictures. It's a wonderful business on these cruises. There's loads of King Birdwoods, people with much better cameras than mine, and they're all very happy to share. So these are all um, filched from, and we gratefully from other people. Um, so after that, we, we set off to see um, towards the Auckland Islands. Each island group took anything between a day and two to three days of sailing between. So you, you, you get to an island, hopefully a bit of shelter, maybe get to land on some of them, not all of them, and then you'd be two or three days on this little boat um, looking for seabirds as you go. But as you can see, there's some pretty marvelous seabirds to be found there. 
that this is this is on the level or not on the level if you see what i mean this, this is just a, a little bit of pitch and roll on the on the ship you can see it's not exactly a flashy vessel but uh, it was it was okay and then uh, yeah that, that's when it got really bad you couldn't get any espresso in the, in the canteen but as with most of these um, ships they allow you up on the bridge and and it's a great place to go when it's raining or, or windy or cold you can stand up on the bridge and get a, a really good panoramic view um, to see what's about so we eventually get to the Auckland Islands and down this steep gangway into the Zodiacs these massive great inflatables with a big powerful engine and a sort of a, a, a rigid floor at the bottom and you know a dozen people in each and off you go exploring so the Auckland Islands, you remember, is about the same size as Isla. Um, the two black arrows are, are the two places that we landed in. And uh, say one of the larger groups with better soils and more luxuriant vegetation, the, the, the settlement that I showed you a picture of was, was there, about 200 people. And they lasted for four years before they all gave up and, and left. Um, so it was, a, it was a, and at the time, this, this is the interesting thing, the, the, obviously the British government was so keen and, and didn't know because they know most of these people making these rules and regulations and laws hadn't been there. The, there was a governor on Auckland Islands who was of the same status as the, uh, it was a, called a lieutenant governor and he was the same status as the lieutenant governor of other colonies such as Canada, Australia and New Zealand but uh, he didn't have much to govern. But after that it was just sporadically used by sealers, whalers and people from various shipwrecks. Um, so once we're ashore, they're quite careful not to allow you to, even though there's only a couple of hundred people a year, they've got these boardwalks made so that you don't trample the vegetation. It's quite sort of fragile and on, on peat. And, and these bigger islands do, I mean, I'm, I'm not a, um, a, a great botanist, but a lot of people were raving about the, the, the plant life. It's uh, almost everything there is unique. And it, it's this stuff called mega herbs. They, they grow in a very special way to combat this fiercely windy, salt laden atmosphere. And that's, that's one of the lovely big, uh, mega herbs that you you can see there so it's 84 percent of the flora endemic and it all looks lovely on a day like this this is a, a little sort of research station that wasn't um, manned when we were there we came into this bay and landed and had a walk around it's a lovely sunny day but uh, you know a, a winter's day when it's blowing a gale it, it, it would not be a particularly nice place but it doesn't look that dissimilar from a lot of the scottish islands that i'm sure a lot of us are very familiar with but uh, it's the birds that we were, were after. Um, there's a number of quite regular land birds that occur in mainland New Zealand as well. It's a tomtit at the top here and a, and a red-fronted parakeet. But what I found very strange is that on the mainland of New Zealand, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of thriving introduced birds from Europe. They were introduced, they were brought down by ship in the 1800s, and now they've made their own way. They haven't been introduced to these islands. They've just started sort of moving up and down New Zealand and got blown out to the islands here. So you've got red poles, starlings, dunnocks, chaffinches, greenfinches on, on these islands as well, but at least they've made it there under their own steam. Um, slightly more interesting, there's giant petrels nesting here. There's a chick there. Um, there's a one of the, the, the plovers, double banded plover, and, and this thing, a, a thing called a New Zealand falcon, which had, I hadn't realized before, I've seen them before, but seeing them flying around, you realize that they've got um, very short wings because they're feeding mostly on small birds in the, in the woodland, this sort of stunted trees that you can see up here. So they're behaving more like a sparrowhawk with short wings to maneuver through um, woodland rather than these long pointed wings for fast flight that you associate um, falcons with. But um, some of the more special birds were, were these things. You get a few yellow-eyed penguins um, in mainland New Zealand, but they are, they're on a very sticky wicket there. There's not many left. And we start seeing the um, first of many, many different species of, of shags, you know, cormorants, 
um, every one of these island groups has a what is now deemed to be a, a separate species of shag and they honestly they all look the same they're all black and white with nice bits of color around the eyes but everyone is apparently different so this is the Auckland island shag we saw over 10 species whilst on our trip um, much more interesting were these two little things this is a, a an Auckland Islands teal and the Auckland Islands snipe um, the teal is flightless. You can see there it's flapping its wings and it wouldn't get very far with those. And this snipe too behaves more like a rail. I never saw one fly the whole time I was there. They just creep about in the undergrowth. Um, very, very interesting bit of um, evolution there. Very vulnerable, both of them, to, to, um, to introduce rats and, and what have you. So they're in incredibly small numbers. And then at the south end of the Aucklands, we, we came here um, to Carnley Harbour um, to climb up to a, um, a white-capped albatross colony. That's myself and a friend of mine. Um, and on just having finished the climb, you can see in the distance there between our two heads, there's the ship. Long way off, so we zodiaced all the way up here and then hiked up several hundred feet to get to this albatross colony. And there you can see some of them on, on the cliffs flying by. Again, you know, the habitat looks not, not dissimilar to a lot of Isla, really. There's a close up of the white capped albatross. The, the, typically, a lot of these um, molly mork albatrosses build these big pedestal mud nests and they add to them year after year. And then in the afternoon, you go cruising in the zodiacs. You, 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 stick everything on you know waterproofs everything in case you get splashed with seawater or it rains or or whatever but some fantastic geology there these massive natural sea arches um and you can see here that you know looking through this arch there's there's some quite substantial trees here on on, on this particular island And then yet another species of penguin, very similar, the same genus as the snares, but it, it, this is a much more widespread thing. You'll see this all the way around the Antarctic, and you've probably seen films with um, one of Attenborough's films of the Antarctica, where these poor things are being pounded around in the salt spray and waves and climbing hundreds of metres up precipitous cliffs. These ones have it quite easy. They, they just sort of land and disappear into this vegetation. It's quite... Uh, quite serene for them compared to what they have to put up with elsewhere. So after that, we've got another couple of days at sea going south towards Macquarie Island. Um, masses more seabirds. Um, these things in the top left are called prions. They're a type of petrel and horribly difficult to separate from one another. Um, that's a, a wandering albatross and a light mantled sooty albatross. And this picture just shows you the sheer numbers of birds um, around us. Um, luckily for, for me, um, there were lots of very, very good photographers on the island, uh, on, on the ship. And the way to sort these birds out, you're, you're standing on a moving ship, desperately trying to hold your binoculars still very difficult to work out what they are. But now with digital, good digital cameras, people were taking pictures of everything and then working out what they were looking at in detail in the evening over a cup of coffee. Not many whales, we did see some orcas as well, but this was really the only large cetacean that we saw the whole time, which is disappointing, but given the amount of whaling gone on there in the past, I suppose it's not surprising. This is just another quick, quick clip. <laughs> everybody wants to see is the tail of the whale and eventually we get to Macquarie Island so we're now in Australia briefly um, great place it was a long long thin string of an island as I say pushed up if this is part of the earth's crust that's been pushed up between two plates um, that there is the station you can see there the, the, where I'm circling now and they're getting very worried about sea level rises and they're rebuilding it up on the top of this uh, hill now 
and so landing in zodiacs they invite us in for a warm-up and some freshly baked scones and show us the meteorological balloons and so on and then guide us around the island as you land it's not difficult to see the wildlife you're tripping over it most of the time so uh, the, these are it's like so many animals isn't it they're really cute when they're when they're young these are young elephant seals you know big doughy eyed things and then then they grow up into this um and these these are just massive um elephant seals they're um eight thousand pounds three and a half thousand kilos the biggest pinniped in the world um but it's also worth bearing in mind that you know they're so easy to walk up to that they were so easy to club to death and 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 uh boil down for their oil when when they were being slaughtered they're they're, they're, there's about 600,000 left um, right way right, the way around Antarctica now. And this again is a short, short video clip of a couple of young bulls that are testing each other out. one of those you trip over and get squashed you, you, you'd know it this was a bonus we weren't expecting to see this species it's usually much further south in true Antarctica but one one was sitting on the beach while we were there so that was a, a, a bonus penguin chinstrap penguin very obviously named um, and then these things breeding gen two, these are gentoo penguins which are again quite quite sort of um, widespread right the way around Antarctica but always lovely to see and this gives you a, gives a bit of an idea of the of the shape of Macquarie there's this big sort of ridge that just runs for about 30 kilometers about five kilometers wide and some big beaches there we, we landed on one of these beaches to go and look for other better birds but again some some wonderful flora for those interested in, in botany these cushion plants and uh, Typical sort of salt tolerant, wind tolerant, you know, very sort of glaucous, hairy leaves. But again, they're very careful not to allow us to, to trample the vegetation. This is a big sort of swathe of tussock grass that they built this very elaborate boardwalk up to, to go to view a, um, a royal penguin colony. Um, and the penguins themselves have to sort of climb up and down here you know every day every day of the week but so we we get this lovely boardwalk to to use and when you get to the top this is a this is the view of, of a few royal penguins again similar um same genus as the rock hoppers and snares ones with these lovely um flared yellow tufts on their heads but um you can see how they can survive in such cold conditions can't you I mean, this thing's so rotund i mean it's just a great ball of fat and blubber um so that it can spend days and days and days in those icy cold seas um then apparently not endangered but it's the only place in the world where they breed so this is like the snares island this is the only only island where royal penguins um are there's about three million pairs now but at one point um, there on this island, there were 150,000 penguins, including kings, killed for their oil annually between 1870 and 1919. So, you know, the slaughter was massive. And this was after they got rid of all the, the seals and sea lions, which were much more valuable. Again, a bit of a clip. <laughs>
Fun though, not too. Yeah. You smell a little bit like sheep. Yeah. So, best part of a tidy few there. It, of course, they're quite easy to count now because you just sort of take a drone picture and count the dots below you and they're all very neatly spaced. They're all on nests here. They, they build little pebbly nests and equally um, spaced from their neighbours. And uh, so, you know, they can do some fairly accurate censuses of these things. But um, these are the, the, the class. I mean, king, king penguins too are, you know, they're, they're quite regular right the way around. I've seen them in the Falklands and South Georgia and places like this, but they're always so special to see. They're so spectacular that you never, never get tired of um, looking at king penguins. Um, there's about 200,000 pairs here. The, the, this thing down here that looks like it's got a fur coat on, of course, is one of the young birds. They take over it more than a year to mature because um, they're, they're, they're so slow growing. But uh, you know the the photographs. You know the, the, you'll notice that most of the clips that I'm taking, you've got this background noise of wind blowing. Well, here the other background noise was camera shutters going. You know they're so photogenic. And again, a little. <laughs> So it's a fabulous noise. I mean, it's, it's a, such a, 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 an evocative, you know, bugling call. And, and you see this great big fat youngster begging for food there. But they have to because they get abandoned for weeks and weeks at a time between feeding. And, and, uh, and they have to sort of spend a winter like that, molting out of their, their fluffy coat into, into adulthood. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tough life. But um, so that was Macquarie Island. Um, and then we're off at sea again for another day and a half towards the Campbell Islands. Um, plenty more seabirds to see along the way. One or two views of orca down here um, in the bottom left. Um, what else have we got here? There's a Wilson storm petrel there. Um, yet another prion that all the keen bird watchers argued about. Was it this one or was it that one? Um, and there's a, a royal albatross. And this thing here is. Um, the first of the Campbell Island albatross. It, there's a great tendency now for, for birds. I mean, when I first started bird watching, you know, 40, 50 years ago, there were about 8,000 species. Now there's over 10 and a half. And it's not because they discovered two and a half that they didn't know were there. They just split a lot of the time, they just split them. So this was originally just a black browed albatross breeding on one island and it happened to have a white eye. Um, but now they done DNA on it and decided it's a, it's a full species. So nice distinctive bird with this white eye and the black brow. So it's a, it's a Campbell Island albatross. And here we are, Campbell Island, more of this fabulous, rich mega herb vegetation. Um, I took a picture of this thing at the bottom. There, there was a, the New Zealand Royal Navy were there um, doing some repairs to the research station. And, um, the bloke obviously writing on the, 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 the hazards thing was having jokes. He's, with regard to sea lions, he's written there, not to be taken home, don't make good pets. Um, despite, yeah, well, you could see how easy it would be to pick up one of those elephants. Well, not easy to pick them up, but they ideal looking, lovely looking things, but they've got big teeth, big teeth, and you don't want to mess with them. Um, so these are, New Zealand fur seals in the top left and hookers sea lions, the, the, the bigger picture there. Um, 
bit misleading calling them seals because they are more related to sea lions. They've got external ears and they can move about on land by using their rear, rear flippers. Um, hookers is the rarest of all the world's sea lions with a very limited range, almost exclusively in New Zealand. Um, and uh, the numbers are recovering now after industrial scale slaughter for fur and oil right up into the early 1900s. Um, the, these islands were, were, were sort of kept a secret once they were discovered. Nobody who was there making a, literally making a killing and, and, and financially making a killing would tell any of the other mariners where they were going because they just wanted it all for themselves. Um, expeditionary ships from New Zealand and Britain were followed by colonisation in the late 1800s and, and they did attempt farming until 1930 and then they abandoned it in 1930 and left behind, amongst other things, 4,000 sheep and a whole load of cattle. Um, so there's now a massive pest eradication program. Fairly easy to get rid of sheep and cows, but you know, when it comes to rats and all the rest of it, it's a major job. Um, I think that they, they dropped about 120 tonnes of, of uh, poison bait on the island. Um, and of course, they, they do it when the, seabird, the breeding seabirds are, are, are away. Um, not that they would particularly ingest it, but um, you know, trying to to make it as safe as possible. But here you are. This is the other big island, and here's the. the I, I said there, you know, I, 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 this is tongue in cheek, distinctly different from their Auckland Island cousins. You know, there's another snipe and another another teal and another another shag, and you know, you, they they're just like cookie cutters. They're they're very much the same, but deemed to be separate island endemics. Um, there's only about 50 to 100 of the teal left in the world um, and the snipe was only discovered on a rat-free offshore island in 1997. They didn't even know it was there um, until you know very very recently within the last 25 years um, but now that they've done this massive eradication program of rats and so on they are they've moved up under their own steam over to the main island and they're slowly slowly building up numbers. So we did another long hike up into the up into the hills. You can see very very misty, um, but some fabulous um, albatrosses to look at. This is my favourite bird in the world, light mantle sooty albatross. They're just gorgeous things. They look like they've got velvet rather than rather than fur. Fantastic things. And then these are royal albatrosses. There's a couple of other studies of the royal albatrosses. They're very very big birds. And while we were there, we again another bonus. The, these these things like that chin strap penguin I showed you. They're normally um, a lot further south into Antarctica proper, but there was a, a leopard seal that had come north and was lounging about on the beach. So we got in the zodiacs and had a look at him. Um, quite a formidable predator. You, know, you can see these lovely teeth that they've got there. But in actual fact, they they I mean they take penguins and and things like that. But a lot of the time they're just eating krill. But uh, Good to see it so close. That says it all, this sort of scruffy little ship with a scruffy little porthole and look out every day through the mist and the rain to see how choppy the seas are going to be. But we were on our way again um, at sea to the Antipodes. But again, tons and tons of seabirds to see as you're going along, so no, 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 no boredom. Um, and it gives you something to concentrate on when the sea's rough, you, you know, looking to the horizon and looking at seabirds, it takes your mind off feeling seasick. There's a Chatham Island black-browed albatross again. Um, Cape petrels are very, very common throughout Antarctica and they're always following the ship. Um, that's another royal albatross. And this is a um, mottled petrel, one of the Pteridroma petrels. And it's just a very short clip. This is fun. But as you can see there, you know, the seas weren't too bad. Um, but what's quite bizarre is that there were people in London suggesting that you could go and colonise this and run a sheep farm on it. You know, I don't know how you'd even get onto the island. Uh, you know, it's, it's quite tiny too. I mean, it wasn't, they were just bonkers, but they were just so desperate to stick the British flag on them that uh, they just wanted people down there. 
Um, so no landing on these islands. So um, there's the ship in the distance on the horizon and us in our zodiacs going through some quite long zodiac rides just to see the birds as close as we can from, from the zodiacs. Um, There were 80, on the Antipodes, I was reading up there, but there were 80 men from the USA and the UK somehow set up ashore here between 1805 and 1807. They killed 80,000 fur seals, um, which they sold to the Chinese for a pound a pelt, which was an absolute fortune. 80,000 pounds in those days was, was an absolute fortune. Um, I don't know how they got them to China, but they did. Um, but they even even with that riches, they left after after this because you know the financial returns and the hardship were just too much, and and probably they they killed off virtually all the fur seals anyway, so pretty grim. But you can imagine, you know, early eighteen hundreds working down here, it would have just been absolutely grim, utterly grim. Another one of the very special penguins here. The, a lot of these are quite lookalike. This looks quite similar to the rock hoppers and the snares and, and the um, royals that we've been seeing. But this is again one of these penguins that only occurs on the Antipodes and um, uh, at the, the erect crested penguin. Um, it holds about 60% of the world's population. What's more bizarre down here is you're, you're, you're going along the edge of the, these islands and where, where there's any sort of soil coming down to the coast, there's a few bushes and you get parakeets. Now, I think most of us associate parrots with quite warm tropical climates. And this is, you know, as bleak as you could be here. They really is. And these two parrots are endemic to these islands. Um, what, there's two, you know, two species on this tiny little island. And uh, they survive on, on picking seeds and fruits, and apparently they, they also take flies and, and rotting flesh on any, from any dead fur seals that, that they find along the beach. So, you know, they eke a living out, and, uh, and, and there they are, very nice looking birds, but it just seems such an odd place to see them. So we had a long period without getting ashore. Um, we had several days getting to, to the Antipodes and then more days onto the Bounty Islands. Um, again, no landing allowed, you just, just can't, can't go there. And when, I should say, when you do go ashore, all the places we were allowed ashore, there was a rigorous um, system of cleaning all your equipment. All your boots had to be disinfected, your coats, hats, gloves, everything was vacuumed, checked for seeds, anything like that you know, almost down to your underwear before they'd allow you ashore. So the bounties seem to be the barest and bleakest of the lot. There's only one species of vascular plant there, um, a, a scurvy grass, which was quite useful for, for, for the sailors. Um, and uh, it's got the largest world colony of Salwin's albatross here, plus, of course, another endemic shag. but this gives you a brief idea of the sheer numbers of seabirds offshore. I mean, th these islands are totally uninhabited, nobody ever lands there, and they're, they're just completely given over to, to the birds. <laughs> Huge numbers of birds offshore the whole time to, to, to look at if you can hold your binoculars steady. Um, on shore there were there were birds to be seen. There's the our equivalent of our bonksy, you know, great skewer, which is the the, the Antarctic or brown skewer. Um, yet another prion. I think this one was um, Fulmer, called Fulmer prion. It's got a heavier bill. Um, Salvin's albatross just clipping the waves there and Antarctic terns nesting. And then we start heading north out of the true subantarctic islands, going north now towards the Chatham Islands. And uh, this place, understandably called Pyramid Rock, um, where the entire world population of the Chatham albatross 
breeds. And that is a, a Chatham albatross coming into land. Um, they reckon there's about 5,300 pairs of this bird in the world and, and they're all on this one offshore rock. And as you approach, there's low, it's, a, it's a big island complex and there's lots of these very, very jagged, tiny islands which, which have a much better, there's, there's much more going for them because they weren't colonised so much and there's less um, influence of introduced rats and cats and things like that. Um, one of the very, there are two special birds there, there's the Chatham Islands petrel and the Tycho or Magenta petrel, both of them down to sort of 50, 100, 150 birds in the world. They were almost on their last legs being eaten up by cats because they're nesting in burrows on, in, on land. And we did manage to see one of these uh, magenta petrels. It's called magenta because it was the ship, the HMS Magenta that, that um, first noticed it, not because it's got any magenta on it. So we're now up in the Chatham Islands, the last island group that, that we visited, and these were colonised early by um, about 1500. The, the, the Maori didn't get to New Zealand until the 11, 12, 1300, so they weren't that much earlier than, than Europeans, but and the Chatham Islands even later. So the Chatham Islands are quite a large group, you know, two times, three times the size of Isla, warmer, a lot more bird life, totally uninhabited by human beings until the 1500s when the Moriori got there. And apparently there's this very sad story. They were very welcoming, um, peaceful people. Um, but when the Europeans went to colonize the islands, they took a load of Maori with them from mainland New Zealand who basically slaughtered the lot of them. You know, they, they just started fighting with them, slaughtered them, enslaved them. And, and there's very, very few Moriori left. So this is very, very different now to, to what we've been seeing beforehand. These are the only islands that have a, a population. There's about 600 people, uh, resident population, six, 700. It's all fishing and farming. Um, even though they're 500 miles from the mainland New Zealand, they still manage to be quite wealthy. Um, you know, you'd think that the transport costs would, would prohibit anything developing out there, but they all look pretty well off. Um, so it's much better land, much better soil, and it all seemed quite tropical after, after being in the sub-Antarctic islands. Um, that's how difficult it is to get to see a decent view of an albatross, you know, take food out of your hands. These are, um, just as we were going into, into, uh, land there, these are Buller's albatrosses. And very, very sad, I mean, th this would have all been thick stunted forest in the 1500s when the Moriori first got there and certainly most of it was probably still intact before before the Europeans got it but you know they just it, you can see great trails of dust it's all gone cattle and it's all gone to cattle and sheep branching tiny tiny bits of, of land left and this is where most of the extinctions occurred there were 11 species of endemic bird here that are now gone little bits of it left preserved behind fences, um, tree ferns and so on. And this is where they're doing immensely labor intensive projects to try and keep the, the petrels going and, and save some of the few um, native birds that are still there. A few endemics, this is a, a thing called a Chatham Island Jerigony. And that's a Chatham Island pigeon. Um, this thing is a shore plover. Um, there are again only about um, what was the latest count? Um, oh, tiny, tiny numbers. Um, it's the, the the thing at the bottom left here is is a weka. This is a, a native endemic New Zealand bird. And for some strange reason, after the, all of these native rails were exterminated they brought this thing over and it's quite a feisty bird and it's it, they're trying now to get rid of them because they they spread like wildfire they're eating the birds eggs and chicks and have become a real pest so they're hunting them and trying to get rid of them um i've got in my notes here yet another boring oyster catcher 
Um, there, there are about a dozen species or so of oyster catchers around the world, and almost all of them are black and white and look almost the same as the one you can see outside of my house here in Brookladdy. Um, but it's endemic and it's a, it's a ticket, you know, so a king bird watchers want to go and see it. But where the, this picture was taken from, not the bird, the, the, the view, um, just behind me, there was this very inviting gift shop, flogging cold beers. And um, we thought, well, we've got to go and see this bird. And it was right up the far end of the beach. So we commandeered a, um, a minibus, went zooming up the beach, um, didn't even bother to get out of the car, quite honestly. Quickly saw it, thought, yeah, another oyster catcher, tick, and, and back, to the, back to the cold beer. Um, but there are some more interesting, interesting birds there. Um, offshore islands, mangra, you can see how, how precipitous and difficult they are. Um, white fronted terns. Um, the only interesting looking cormorant shag of the lot, this is Pitt Island, which isn't black and white. And it's got this funny green bare skin there. Um, the bird in the middle is the Chatham Islands black robin. I mean, talk about being saved by the skin of its teeth. This bird must be the, you know, absolutely take the biscuit. Um, it's an astonishing story. It was brought back from extinction in the late 1900s. There was one point where there were only five of these left in the world and only one fertile breeding female. So five birds left. And they've now managed to captive breed them, release them onto these islands, offshore islands that don't have rats. And there's now about 250 of them, but absolutely scooped up from the, from the brink of extinction. One of the Zodiacs actually saw one of these. We all had radio contact with one another and you're not allowed to land, but someone managed to see one in a bush down by the, by the beach as they were looking from their Zodiacs. We went zooming along and, and it had gone. So that's, that's one that got away, I'm afraid, but um, I don't think I should be going back just to look for that. So that was the very last of the Zodiac landings. Now we pull the Zodiacs up and start heading uh, three days back to New Zealand towards the end of the trip, but um, still plenty to, plenty to do. Um, lots of very good lectures up here, you know, um, sort of very good staff on board giving lectures about the history, the geology, the wildlife and weather and all sorts of things. And then there's this thing that some of you may not be familiar with called chumming. Um, this ghastly looking picture here is a bucket of dead rotting fish and you chuck it over the back and it attracts seabirds in so that you can see them more closely, get pictures and so on and so forth. Can be a bit dodgy. This is my friend Alistair who looking like he's having great fun having just had a, a huge wave come through that hole there and, and got him soaking right out to his thighs. But uh, it's all part of the fun. And you can see here that you know, with, with this chumming, there's this albatross is coming in, taking away fish heads and masses and masses of birds to keep us going. And the final fling of, of some marvellous, marvellous seabirds. Um, there's a sooty shearwater in the top left here. Um, Buller's shearwater, bottom left. Um, this thing, this all dark bird in the bottom right is called a white chin petrel. Goodness knows why. It's got this tiny, some of them do, some of them don't. It's got about three feathers underneath its bill that are white. And so some taxonomists call it white chin petrel. But uh, there we are. And uh, then there's a grey-backed storm petrel up here and black-bellied storm petrel there. So a lovely variety. Here's some more. Um, this is um, white-faced storm petrel, white-headed petrel, um, another, yet another prion. And this is um, soft-plumaged petrel. Lovely name, soft-plumaged petrel. The thing in the middle is our last, the last penguin of the trip that we saw. This is little penguin, little tiny thing that you can see in Australia and, and New Zealand. And of course the last albatrosses, the last looks at these fabulous light-mantled sooties, um, young wandering albatrosses, that's a young black-browed albatross and a, a royal albatross, huge things. And uh, the very final albatross in a sunset. Um, that says it all really there. This was the quote from the World Heritage nomination. Days when these islands are enveloped in unsurpassed bleakness and days of bright blue clarity when they are the most invigorating wild places on earth. So, um, so that, that, that was it. Um, but uh, 
it was a it was a great trip um phenomenal unique um to one of the re most remote areas on on the planet um nine species of penguin nine or 12 species of albatross depending on what taxonomy you believe 10 or 11 species of shags 25 petrels and shearwaters four storm petrels about 60 species of seabirds in all most of them endemic to the sub-antarctic islands we only saw about 120 species of birds in just under three weeks but it was sort of quality rather than rather than quantity and uh so I think we travelled, I calculated, we travelled about 3,000 odd miles by sea and uh, I would encourage anyone to do it, but you know, you might need to win the lottery and, and take your seasick pills with you. So thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you very much, um, Pete. That was really interesting. Um, it kind of, it keeps touching when you go to New Zealand on the problems of introduced animals so it's yeah. quite your last talk was quite depressing on that matter and you know, <laughs> so, but they, they've turned it all you know they're working on it and turning it all around but that's um yeah that was really good and I have to thank all these people for their lovely pictures and, yes indeed and you wax yeah. lyrical about when you get talking about birds it's great um but i'd like to thank you really for that for that talk dave i don't know if you want to Throw it open to questions from anyone else. Yes, that was brilliant, Peter. Thanks a lot. I, I echo Fiona's uh, sort of synopsis that yeah, the, the, the uh, colonial history and the and is awful. Mm. <laughs> the sort of colonization of these things with the animals. I mean, it wasn't so bad just being there and slaughtering the stuff. It was introducing all this stuff. Mm. Yeah. And um, but at least it's it's quite uplifting. I think that you've shown us that these islands, the, you know, the, the, are now being maintained and brought back to where they were, and that's great. And it's good. It's that's uplifting to see that that's that's yes. all. Yes, I mean it, it's if if New Zealand didn't have offshore islands, then it would be a real mess because you know those offshore islands are the, are the, the few places where you can. Where, where sometimes there aren't any um, introduced animals or they can at least get rid of them and, and, and revitalize the natural wildlife but if there were no offshore islands there would be many many more extinct birds in New Zealand I'm sure. So if anyone else has got any questions and want to just chat about something ask Peter a question about uh, fantastic wildlife go ahead just unmute yourself and just ask a question yeah you've got something to say. Hi Dave, it's Beryl. Uh, Pete, can you hear me? Yes I can. Right, did you encounter any modern pollution? Um, yes, I mean it's not too bad down there because you're miles and miles away from any any regular shipping route. So we, we didn't see another ship the whole time that we were down there in three weeks other than a, a, Royal, a, a New Zealand Navy vessel, that was it. Um, no fishing boats, I mean all of those seas now are quite well protected from fishing. Um, I'm sure there must be stuff washing up, but it's nowhere near as bad as in other parts of the world. Um, but, you know, I'm sure that there would be scientists down there um, doing studies on these seabirds still saying that, you know, they're ingesting plastics and left, right and centre. So, um, but I didn't like to think of that. I just, I just enjoyed watching them. <laughs> <laughs> Too depressing otherwise. <laughs> You know, how, how do they, do the New Zealand government then sort of protect the fishing, their fishery protection vessels? How do they stop these big super trawlers coming and just creeping um, up? Yes, I think, I think they throw quite a bit of money at it, the New Zealanders. Um, you know, I mean, the, these islands themselves, just to, to maintain them and, and, and do what they've done, you know, you're talking millions upon millions of, 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 um, of pounds of expense, and, and it's an ongoing thing. Um, and uh, so yes, I, I mean, they, you can obviously declare your, the waters around your islands, what is it, 200 mile limit or something, and they've got world heritage status and probably all sorts of um, other special sea oceanic status in terms of you know, protected fisheries and so on. So uh, um, I, I think there's probably quite a good presence there. And of course, you know, with nowadays with radar and, and satellites and all the rest of it, you can sit somewhere and just watch and see what's, what, what's traveling and who's going where without actually being there. So. Yes, because the seabird numbers not just must be dependent on there the being a supply of food for them, so there must be 
enough fish for them to eat. Yes, yes. I mean, it, 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 you know, I'm sure you don't like to delve too deeply because you start getting the getting the, the sort of the, the miserable tales. But you know, at least this part of, of Antarctica or, or sub Antarctic is is looking pretty good. I mean, I, I was I was at a I was a, at a seminar on a Zoom meeting the other day with um, BirdLife International talking about seabirds at sea and their attempts at um, stopping this ghastly sort of bycatch. I mean, albatrosses getting caught on squid long lines in their tens of thousands are seriously um, impinging on world populations and, and it's just all unnecessary. They've worked out ways of doing it um, to, to stop them getting caught, but um, you know, trying to police that. But they were saying too that, you know, they, they can now tell where boats are, where, where fishing vessels are and what they're doing just by, by satellite. So, um, and, and then check them afterwards. But yeah, it, it's, it's, it can be pretty depressing. But um, yeah, you just like to hope that, that these waters are, are still fairly safely looked after. So, so I see I see two people that were with me in Antarctica on, on this trip. <laughs> Do you want to go to you want to go to the New Zealand subs? <laughs> go on, treat yourselves. Well, you see, no, we did consider coming with you on that boat trip. Yeah. Um, I think we missed a lot, but. Uh, Still, we're still saving up to go back to Antarctica. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty spectacular down there. I think it would be nice to, there was many, many years ago, the Norwegians, when they were whaling down in South Georgia and so on, bought a load of king penguins back with them and tried to sort of release them on the Norwegian fjord. I think it would be quite nice, quite nice to have a little colony of king penguins on Isla myself. <laughs> I, could, I could just see them waddling up and down Macu Bay. That would be brilliant. Sure, well, that wasn't Monty Python. <laughs> yes. You can you can see the Bruchladi distillation already, <laughs> can't you? Yeah, yeah, they had a yellow submarine. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it looked a fascinating trip, but too too many days at sea for me without landing. <laughs> yes, I must admit I was quite surprised. I knew that there were a couple of days between some of the islands, and it wasn't until I paid up rather foolishly. Not that it would have stopped me. Um, I, when I read the itinerary, I, it said that, you know, you can't land in these places. So although you were getting to the islands, you were still confined to the ship or Zodiac. So you, you, you didn't set foot on land for sometimes, you know, six days at a time. Um, but it was, I say, we were just very lucky with the, with the weather. It could be really ghastly, sick making seas. And, and that wasn't a particularly large boat, the ship. Um, so um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just so grateful that we, we had decent weather and uh, weren't ill at all. We, we had a look at the ocean-wide uh, trip that goes from Ushuaia to Dunedin, and that's about 30 days at sea. Oh yes, yes, that's going right the way through that area of, goes right of way Antarctic that's got nothing in that it is, at all. Here's another island you can't land at. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So we've we've shelved that one. Yeah. Peter, there's a question from David Jardine saying, were the northern penguins not called great orcs? Well, yes. <laughs> very, very <laughs> true. Just in jest. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, yes. I mean very, very similar, really. Quite you know, convergent evolution at its finest, you know, the an orc that gets too big to fly and just starts looking like a penguin. But it was just unfortunate for the great orc that it happened to be in the northern hemisphere rather than the, the southern. It might have got away with it for a bit longer. But um, yeah, yeah. Well, maybe we should do Emperor King Penguins on in Iceland again then, or St Kilda. But uh, yeah. So. Great talk, Peter. Thank you. Pleasure. It's a pleasure. Yes, there's some good, uh, on the chat line, there's some good uh, comments, people people thanking very much, Peter, for a great chat and great talk and uh, okay. enjoyable talk with fantastic pictures and things. So, uh, Yes, yeah, so, so it's very nice now that, that people are prepared to, to share their photos, because um, I've, I've, I mean, I've been sort of leading wildlife tours for years now, crikey, since the 70s, and 
I'm very aware that if you're trying to lead a tour and show people the birds and wildlife and organize things that taking your own photographs can get in the way. Um, so it's really nice now that with digital photography that you can say to folks um, at the end of the trip, you know, shall we all share our photographs? Meaning, can you give me your photographs in my case? Because I'm not taking any myself. And, and, everyone, and everyone's taken a slightly different perspective on the thing. So you pull them all and I send them out to, to the group on a memory stick. And they, but in fact, on, on these cruises, they do a fantastic job of um, all, the, all the staff on the, on the vessel are all brilliant photographers with you know high class you know with canon lenses and what have you and they're all taking pictures deliberately and they they, they present you in fact i've got it right here there's a little memory stick with um all of the pictures that they've taken and they're taking pictures of people and so on so you know it's a lovely memento to have and you don't have to to bother yourself but uh, so it's all very nice i'm telling you as a non-birder what what is a prion it's it's a it's a it's a seabird. It's in the it's in the same family as um, petrels and shearwaters. You know the tube noses. It's got the external nas nasal openings for, for excreting salt and, and smelling food and so on and so forth. Um, but they're just a sort of a mid-sized um, petrel that, and all of the species live in the Antarctic, subantarctic, um, and they they're just very 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 similar and you know masses and masses of discussion with the really keen guys about you know did this bird did the eye stripe go slightly behind the eye or was it just in front of it and you're you're there sort of in you saw all those video clips you know there was this gale blowing in the background and trying to hold your binoculars steady and see all this stuff was just impossible so i was really delighted that they were taking pictures and and in the evening we, we'd have a everyone would get together in the bar and and talk about what we'd seen and 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 get the actual official verdict of which which species these things were because the digital you know captures it freezes it and you can zoom in zoom out and look at features and, and work out what it was that you were looking at otherwise it would be very very difficult but uh, yeah so that that's what a, a prion is it's just a very tricky little petrol a little bit smaller i've never heard of them that's all fact. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's presuming they never you never see them up in the northern hemisphere yeah i don't know how they got that name prion um but in the boxes, I don't know. That's what they are. There's some homework for me. Go and find out why, <laughs> why they're called prion. But, so, yeah, so just, just like a shear water, a little bit smaller. All right, I'm reading the messages. All right. Yeah, very nice. So, there we are. Okay. Well, if, anyone, and if there's no more questions and then no more chat, we'll uh, we'll uh, say thank you very much to Peter for uh, yes. giving up his time and his enthusiasm to us. It's been a wonderful talk. I've really enjoyed it. Just, and, a, uh, just a shame that we can't all get together now over a cup of tea and some ginger cake, isn't it? Oh, yes, we'll just have a, <laughs> we'll just a virtual cake and uh, yeah, yeah. And all say thank, thank you very much to, to Peter Thanks, for Peter. All his efforts there. Thank, thank you very you, much. Peter. Okie dokie. Could be a whiskey toast. Should be, yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. Only got a glass of empty wine, but yeah. <laughs> Mind your little water. Good. Okay then. Okay. See you all again. When's the next talk, Fiona? Do we know? Um, no, I've uh, been putting, you know, asks out to various folk, but hopefully by next month we'll have something and uh, we might even be able to co combine it with a with an AGM type thing and get all that business out out the way um we'll hopefully have a few peatland talks and things as well coming up oh, yes. so yeah Good. Good. i shall say okay. thanks everybody thank you bye. pete bye 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 now dave how many folk booked through eventbrite do you know um when i looked at it it was about half a dozen i think but i'll check I can check. Uh -huh. Aye, that's fine. That's quite interested to know where folk have channeled through. Yeah, well, it's uh, you know, it's, it's it's a way of doing it. Um, it's arguably if you're going to put an event out on into the, into Facebook and into Twitter and the Twitter sphere, it's uh, 
that to people you don't know, it's best to use Eventbrite because at least they have to register with it. You know, you've got a sort of record of. You could just put it out and put the Zoom invite out to everybody, but it's it's not recommended. Yeah. Oh well. Yeah, it was lovely okay. talk. It was good, wasn't it? No, it was good. It was good. So I've got uh, Fiona has been talking to um, Laurie Campbell. We we're hoping to try and get him to do us a talk mm -hmm. at some point on peatland. So he'll have some good pictures. Um, so, yeah. Uh, right. Thanks for setting all that up, Dave. Once okay. Again. Right. So, we'll, uh, okay. uh, Hopefully get to Isla soon. Yes. <laughs> don't know when. So when do you, all right. yeah, well, we just let me know when you, if you get a date for, for another talk and we can set it up and do, get some, get it advertised and yeah. get it out there. Okay. I, of, uh, yeah. All okay. right, Dave, thank you very much. Thank you, okay. everybody else. All right. Yes. You enjoy that, Mum? You have to unmute yourself. You can't hear you. We can't hear you. You have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself. I didn't realize I would have muted. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. You enjoy that? Yes. Uh, I say I got. I managed to understand hear most of it, but there's, there's quite a bit I did miss. But uh, there oh, well. we are. Nice pictures anyway, yeah? Yeah. Anyway, thanks for letting me know. I don't think I fancy you yeah. spending what must have been right. quite a lot of money to spend it, most of it time on a tossing boat. I think <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, love. Okay. See you soon. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.